I love my life. It's my beautiful cedar palace. I get to live here. I have been hand chosen as king. I get to worship in my luxurious house. And Nathan, look at that. The other followers are out there worshiping in their quaint little tent. <laughs> Nathan, go and tell my servant David that I have a message for him. Are you the one to build me a temple to live in? I have never lived in a temple from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a church as my home. I have never asked for my people to build me a big, beautiful palace. You are right, my lord. David needs to hear this, and many are probably too scared to tell him the truth. Tell him I took him from a young shepherd boy and placed him in charge of my people. I have been with him wherever he has gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies. Do not forget this. Nathan, read this story to him. David, I have a story here from the Lord to tell you. There were two men in a town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned many sheep. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had worked hard to buy. He raised the little lamb of his children and cuddled it like he was his own baby. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. Instead of killing an animal from his own flock, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guests. I, I, as surely the Lord lives, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay the lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and having no pity. You are that man, David. What? See, the Lord anointed you king of Israel and saved you and your mother. Yet you continue to not live by God's word or his teachings. Thank you, Eric and Ben and Pastor Jordan for bringing this incredible story to life for all of us. And so today, I'm gonna to invite everybody to get out your yellow insert that's in your, in your bulletin, or for those who are online, we would invite you to download it from our live stream. This is our G3 guide. It stands for Gather, Grow, and Go. And it's our hope that it's simply another tool as each one of us continues to grow in faith, that you'll see that there's a section where we can take notes, there's some suggested scripture passages for the coming week, there's a spiritual practice to try, a prayer for the week, and even some possibilities for taking next steps in faith. Now we are wrapping up our sermon series for August called Dynamic Duos. We've been looking at some incredible partnerships that we see in scripture. People like Ruth and Naomi, Paul and Timothy, Mary and Elizabeth, and today the prophet Nathan and King David. So would you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for these incredible partnerships that we see in scripture. God, we pray that you would speak into our own hearts today to show us those ways in which we can both receive the truth and share the truth in love with others. God, we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So Chuck Colson, he was a key leader in President Richard Nixon's administration. Now in 1972, Nixon was running for president again. Now, Chuck, he was known for being Nixon's right-hand man. He was also known for being Nixon's hatchet man, that he would do just about anything to get Nixon reelected. Now, some of us experienced this firsthand. Some of us have read about it in the history books. But we know that, that Nixon was running against Senator George McGovern, a good Methodist from South Dakota. Now, we celebrated, of course, Senator McGovern's life here at First United Methodist Church a couple of years ago. Now, that was quite a moment in history. 
Now Chuck, he was so devoted to President Nixon that he was once quoted for saying that he would walk over his own grandmother to get Nixon reelected. That's how committed, how loyal he was. Now of course, in 1973, people were starting to learn about the Watergate scandal. And Chuck, he was facing some serious prison time if he was convicted for his involvement in the scandal. Now Chuck had a friend, his name was Tom Phillips, and, and Tom and Chuck, they mostly knew each other professionally. But Tom invited Chuck over for dinner one night, and, and Chuck anticipated that they would talk about his legal troubles, that they would talk about politics. But that night, their conversation took a really unexpected turn. As Tom could see that, that Chuck was hurting, that he needed something more than legal advice, political advice. He needed spiritual advice. And so Tom started to talk about his own faith, his own journey with, with God. And he shared with him a book that had meant the world to him, that had informed his faith called Mere Christianity, written by C.S. Lewis. And one of the passages in Mere Christianity that had really spoken to Tom and that he was feeling compelled to share with Chuck was a passage around pride and how pride can often blind us from seeing our own faults. Pride can blind us from our own wrongdoings. Pride distances us from God. Chuck could see that his friend Tom was sincere. He had always admired Tom. He didn't know that Tom was a Christian, but he could feel the sincerity, the conviction in Tom sharing this very personal part of his life with Chuck. And so Chuck went home that night and he drove into his driveway and he just stopped in his car and he started to weep. He wept for all the ways that he felt like he had, had failed. The ways in which his life had gone on tr off track and, and the sin that he was just carrying and it was such a heavy, heavy weight. And for the first time in many, many years, he prayed. He prayed for forgiveness and he prayed that God would give him a new direction, a new purpose for his life. Well, Chuck ended up going to prison. But rather than seeing that time as a setback, he saw it as an opportunity to continue to grow in his newfound faith. And by the time he was released a couple of years later, Chuck felt conviction in his own life that he needed to share the love of Jesus with others who were living in prison like he had been. And he ended up founding an organization called Prison Fellowship that is now in all 50 states, including right here in South Dakota. It's an organization that's gone nationwide and worldwide as 120 countries have Prison Fellowship, an organization to, committed to sharing the hope and purpose of God's love with people living in prison. Now sometimes as I read stories like that, I start to wonder what if, what if Tom and Chuck had gotten together that night and all they talked about were his legal struggles? What if all they had talked about was politics? What if Tom wouldn't have taken that risk to initiate a spiritual conversation with his friend? In a way, Tom was a Nathan, speaking the truth in love, even though it was risky and it was hard. Now, speak the truth in love is actually a phrase that comes from the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes about this in his letter to the Ephesians. He writes, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. That speaking the truth in love, especially when we're talking about difficult, sensitive topics, it requires kindness and compassion and respect to balance honesty with empathy. 
ensuring that truth is delivered in a way that is constructive rather than harmful, so that when we feel called to speak the truth in love, it's not always what we say that matters, but also how we say it. Now, at the Nelson household, we have a, a bit of a saying. You know, you try to teach your kids things over the years, and, and one of our sayings is, you can't say no offense. Because if you start a sentence with no offense, you know where I'm going with this, right? It's gonna be offensive. That's just how it works. Speaking the truth in love, it is about fostering understanding. It's about fostering growth rather than creating harm or division. And we see this in this story with Nathan and David. Nathan, he is a prophet, and in biblical times, prophets, they communicated the divine will of God. How prophets, they were not very popular, especially with those in power. They often delivered messages from God that leaders simply didn't want to hear. Now, Israel had had King Saul and now King David. And there were lots of sides to King David, as, as our storytellers shared with us today, that David grew up as a shepherd. He is known for standing up against the Philistines, against the Goli giant Goliath, and being victorious. He's a musician. He's a poet. He's credited with writing many of the beloved psalms that we find in the Bible. He was also a military leader, and eventually he becomes a king. Now, he's known as a man after God's own heart. He had this close relationship with God. And God promised that David would have a legacy that would continue on forever. And we see that promise being lived out in Jesus, who comes from the lineage of David. But David was also human. He made mistakes. Nathan bravely confronts King David. He tells him a fictional story, a parable, to help him see that his life has gone off track, that he's made mistakes, that he's sinned against God. You see, David, he had grown comfortable in his life as the king. He enjoyed the luxury, the power this gave him. One day, as David is walking on the roof of his palace when he should have been with his troops, he happens to see a woman named Bathsheba. She's taking a bath on a rooftop. Now, I know this might sound strange to us because we live in South Dakota and there is no way that would happen here. <laughs> but it wasn't that odd back in those days. Those were often the highest places where you could enjoy some privacy. You wouldn't worry about being seen or disturbed by others. But Bathsheba, she was seen. David saw her and he wanted her for himself. David's desire for her leads him to continue to make one bad decision after another, and we see his decision starting to spiral. Now, I want us to pause here for just a moment because there is something uncomfortable about this story. There's discomfort in this story because there is a huge power differential in this story. Now, for many years, Bathsheba, she's often been portrayed as a temptress, as a seducer, but it's much more likely that Bathsheba is a victim to the abuse of power. David has the power, Bathsheba does not. Scripture doesn't tell us what Bathsheba thinks, how she feels, her words, her thoughts, they are not recorded in Scripture, but as contemporary followers of Jesus, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that she would have had very little power to influence this situation. David summons Bathsheba to come to him. She's already married to a man named Uriah. We see a bad decision. After that, Bathsheba sends a message to David that she's pregnant, but her husband is away at war, and so David summons Uriah back home. He tries to orchestrate a situation in which David's sin remains hidden. Bad decision. It doesn't work. David ends up sending Uriah back into the war. He places him on the front lines knowing that Uriah will die. Bad decision. Sometimes when we make bad decisions, they 
kind of pile up, don't they? And that was true for David. They're piling up, they're spiraling, they're pushing him further and further away from God. And so God sends Nathan to intervene, both to hold David accountable, but also to bring him back, to bring David back to God. Because pride has so clouded David's perspective that he thinks when he hears this story about this precious little lamb, that the story is real that he's being asked to make a verdict for someone else. And so Nathan, he's forced to take a much more direct approach, and he ends up saying, no, David, you are that man. Now this brings David to his knees. David immediately admits his mistakes, and he confesses his sins to God, and we see this in Psalm 51, a psalm that David wrote in response to this time in his life. He writes, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight, and you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. David, he doesn't try to justify his sins. He doesn't try to rationalize his behavior. He doesn't even try to downplay his wrongdoing. David takes responsibility for his actions right away, and he genuinely confesses his sins. Now, while there still will be consequences for his sins, telling the truth restores David's relationship with God, and God forgives David. God knows us from the inside out. We don't have to pretend with God, and we can tell God anything because God already knows us. God knew us in our mother's womb. Telling the truth, admitting our sins, confessing our sins to God, it wipes the slate clean. Telling the truth, it unburdens our souls so that we don't have to carry around that guilt and shame anymore, so that we can live as a people who have been forgiven and freed. Honesty. Hearing the truth can make us uncomfortable sometimes, especially when we've made mistakes, when we're at fault. And yet having a commitment to honesty, to speaking the truth in love and receiving the truth in love, because there's two sides to it. It's foundational to creating and building and maintaining healthy relationships with other people, but also a healthy relationship with God. Brian Stevenson, he committed his life to telling the truth. Brian is a renowned civil rights attorney. Now he, fund, he founded his own organization, Equal Justice Initiative, as one of the burdens that God placed on his heart was for people who had been wrongly convicted of crimes. And one of his most well-known cases was a case that involved Walter McMillan. Walter was known as Johnny D. He was convicted of murder in Alabama in the 1980s. Now that trial was riddled with false testimony, with racial injustice, that there were dozens of people who could be a witness to Johnny D, that he was having a fish fry at his home with many of his church friends, actually when the crime was committed. His trial was only a day and a half, and he ended up being sentenced to die. Brian took on his case, and in taking on Johnny D's on Walter's case, not only found justice for Walter, 
who walked out of death row, a freed man six years later. But he also set into motion reform for a system that needed to confront some difficult truths about racism and justice and flaws in the legal system. But one of the things that's interesting about Brian is that he's always approached his work wanting to provide healing, wanting to be constructive. That even in Walter's case, he didn't approach it with anger or retaliation, he approached it with love and compassion for everyone who had been involved. And we wonder, what if? What if he had been angry? What if he had, all he had wanted was retaliation? Would the outcome have been different for Walter? Would it have been different for that broader movement of justice? Now, speaking the truth in love is a biblical principle, and it's powerful. It has the power to bring about real and lasting change, whether that's in our personal relationships, our professional relationships, or even in the broader society. May we be people who are willing to step out, to speak up, and also to receive the truth with that same kind of love and courage and compassion, finding ways to balance honesty with empathy. Just as God used Nathan to restore David, Tom to transform Chuck, Brian to bring justice to Walter, God can use you, God can use me to speak the truth in love, to bring healing, to bring justice, to bring transformation into the world for Jesus. May it be so. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the ways in which you share these incredible stories of dynamic duos that we find in scripture, and especially in the story of Nathan and David. God, there are some uncomfortable truths that are part of the story. God, we pray that you would give us the courage to speak the truth and love and to receive the truth and love even when it's hard. God, we pray that you would show us those ways that we can be a people of compassion and justice, especially for those who have no voice. God, we pray that you would work through us to bring about your light and love both in our community and throughout the world. God, balancing honesty with empathy and looking to you as our guide in all that we say and do especially when, it's, when we're confronting topics that are difficult to talk about, topics that make us uncomfortable. God, show us those ways in which we can be your people, filled with your spirit, to speak the truth in love, with compassion and with grace. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.